Last episode, we sat down with Brandon at the Beat Museum in San Francisco to learn more about the Beat Movement and the way it forever changed the way Americans have thought about not only literature, but life itself. In this episode, we're going to be looking specifically at the relationship between this movement and the city of San Francisco, which has been home to so many interesting people and scenes over the years. This was the epicenter of, of that particular movement. Granted, it, it was a bicoastal movement. A lot of these people came from New York and thereabouts in the East Coast and made their way out here eventually. There were also people that were already here and that were fomenting a counterculture group and a various artistic movements. But there's a lot of things about San Francisco that naturally engendered a lot of different artistic and literary movements. I, I think there's something about I think there's something about San Francisco being this city on the edge of the world. In all of our travels, we've noticed that islands and mountains tend to create unusual local culture. The isolation of these places allow them to develop unique identities, less influenced by mainstream culture. For those of you unfamiliar with the geography of San Francisco, it's right at the edge of the Pacific Rim, attached to the mainland by a rather skinny peninsula. For all intents and purposes, San Francisco is an island. Brandon explained some of the ways San Francisco's location made it a focal point for so many counterculture movements in the 20th century. Uh, there's a scene in, in, in Jack Kerouac's novel On the Road when they reach San Francisco for the first time and they're, they're driving in a car across the Bay Bridge. Uh, Neil Cassidy he says, there's no more land. Can't go no further because there ain't no more land. And I think that that aspect, whether subtly or overtly, was something that, that's influenced a lot of different people over the years, a lot of literary figures. I think it was Oscar Wilde that said something about anyone said to have gone missing is said to have been seen in San Francisco. I think it's kind of like that last city uh, on the West Coast before the wide Pacific Ocean. I've actually had people my age describe to me that, yeah, the reason I'm here is because I can still be in America, but I'm like right at the threshold of it, that it is like this place on the edge. And so I think that that was part of why that became popular. There's a whole bunch of reasons. You could probably write a book, and I'm, I'm sure someone has at some point, about what it is about the nature of this place and what it means and the reason that so many people wound up here and the reason that it, it became the epicenter of so many counterculture movements. A lot of that was because of the beat generation and what they were doing here in the 50s. But how did they get here is the, the, the big question. And I think a lot of that comes out of World War II. I think it's easy to forget that you know, this was the main point of embarkation for soldiers heading off to the Pacific Theater. People were boarding troop ships up at the Fort Mason Depot, just, just a few, just really only a few blocks to the north. And when they were dropped off again, if they survived the war, you get dropped off here in the city and your commanders would be like, hey, thanks for your service, have a nice life. There's this recurring image of this former uh, sailor standing on a dock at Fort Mason or thereabouts with his sea bag next to him looking off at the skyline and being like, well, what now? My own grandfather was born in 1922, the same year as, as Jack Kerouac, and he served in the Navy in the South Pacific through the war. And we used to have conversations that, that most people that went off to World War II, whether to the Pacific or to Europe, it was sort of a tacit understanding that you weren't coming home, or at least the odds were really slim. You lived moment by moment, battle by battle, and hoped for the best. But there really wasn't a whole lot of hope of making it out again. As the war drew on and people faced the reality of probably having to invade mainland Japan, it seemed like survival was a less and less likely eventuality. But there were a lot of people that did make it back, obviously, and people were plunked down here in San Francisco. And many of them who'd never been here before and didn't really have any, any real experience with it. Really, before, honestly, before the counterculture became a thing here, before the beat movement, before all the things that, that came after it, from the hippies to the, the adult scene here on Broadway, or any of these things that kind of established this city's reputation, 
It was just a, a kind of an unremarkable port city. If you were in the Midwest, for example, and you hear about San Francisco, oh yeah, that's that place on the West Coast. But it, there wasn't, you know, a whole lot of distinction to it, or like much of a draw. But all of a sudden, these people found themselves here, and they were like, this this place looks pretty nice. Let's see if I can make a go of it here. This is something that the poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti talks a lot about: is is that the war displaced a lot of people, whether it was people migrating throughout the country looking for work. In the war industries, we have a Rosie the Riveter Museum over in Richmond that a lot of people don't even know about, but that was a big thing. Women were moving into the workforce and you know, working like hardcore industrial jobs. And a lot of the, like the descendants of the former slaves were moving up from the South and migrating throughout the country, in, in many cases for the first time. And they ended up here as well. And you've probably heard of the Fillmore jazz scene. People started calling that that stretch of Fillmore Street, like Harlem of the West, because it became a huge black arts movement center. And that was something that also inspired the beat generation. They were super into jazz and that was kind of their their soundtrack. And so what was happening during the war was that all these people were migrating and moving around and finding themselves displaced for you know one reason or another and settling in places that, that they you know probably didn't expect. And whenever you do that, whenever you, you add that sort of random element, it causes some interesting things to happen. I asked for an example of how this migration and displacement impacted the beat generation in particular. Traditionally, in major American cities, that was where you found you know, large enclaves of immigrants from all over the world. Places like New York City, just like here, you have... Little Italy and Chinatown are right next to each other. You have you have all these these pockets of places where where people settle. You probably largely because at some point someone from this country or that country moved to a given place, and they became the only person that spoke the language. And then your aunts and uncles, your friends and neighbors move once again from the old country. And you're the only person that speaks the language. It's you know, their, their their only point of familiarity, and so you cluster together. And um, that's always happened in 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 cities traditionally. And so cities become this big cross section of cultures. They they become a crossroads, much like Constantinople was in the late Roman world, or places like like uh, Morocco or the south of Spain. Over the the ensuing centuries, people moved through those places and. Everyone that moved through those places imprinted upon them a, a bit of themselves, a, a little bit of their their culture, their language rubbed off, and and so you found that in cities, like for example in New York in in the post war era when so called white flight started happening and the rise of suburbia and all that in in the, in the post war years people could afford you know a down payment on a house in the suburbs with their GI check. A lot of people were like, well, this is a great chance to you know, move out of my hell's kitchen tenement and a cul-de-sac in in you know Westchester or somewhere what ended up happening was a lot of the a lot of the more middle class people left in mass and cities slowly fell into decay cuz cities fund their infrastructure based on property taxes and so when all the the property tax revenue dries up Things get dicey. There's not enough money to run the sanitation or police or fire or subway or any of that. And so, like, New York started to decay, as many major American cities did. But what was interesting was, as urban decay set in and rents went down, if you were willing to put up with some of that, you still could have access to a lot of the things that a city afforded. And that was the closeness of community. That's really the core of that is like why places like New York City, places like Greenwich Village and the Lower East Side like that became such incubators of such now well-known art scenes. All those things that happened there was because people could live there for cheap. And that's something that really is the crux of all of that. Here in, in North Beach, since, since we're talking about San Francisco here and I keep going on about New York, here in North Beach, so much of the, the housing was actually built for people who were like itinerant workers, like sailors and longshoremen. Like above most of these storefronts, including the, the one we're sitting in now, were these 
these single room occupancy hotels. Just a tiny, like practically a cell of 15 by 20 with a sink in the corner and a bathroom down the hall, usually no kitchen. One of the things that people often ask, why North Beach? Why did, you know, why did things get, why did the poetry scene blow up here as opposed to, I don't know, the Mission District or Pacific Heights or someplace like that? And I think a lot of that had to do with, once again, North Beach was a community of immigrants. North Beach is just San Francisco's name for Little Italy. That's that's really it. And I mean, obviously it included a lot of other people as well, but in, back in those days, it was heavily Italian. And this is the Italian quarter of town. And because many of the people in the community made their living from the sea, it was in close proximity to the sea. So many of the Italian immigrants here, they were they were fishermen, they were longshoremen, they, they made their living from the port. This was the first place that when you got off a ship that arrived in San Francisco, this was the first place you came. And all those connections and that constant sort of infusion of new people and, and from, from all sorts of different places, I think that had a lot to do with it. One of the earliest incarnations of what would later be called the San Francisco Renaissance, which is the umbrella term that encompasses the beat generation and, and all the other you know, things that were happening in San Francisco artistically mid-century was actually over on Fillmore Street. And this connects a little bit later, but I think I mentioned how the lower Fillmore, like around Fillmore and Geary, were like the, the Fillmore Auditorium that became famous in the 60s for all the, the rock concerts. That was the old Fillmore. That was, you know, what was called by many people the Harlem of the West. It was the, the Jazz District, Black Arts District. Just north of that, in what's now the marina, there was a small little enclave of art galleries that popped up in the late 40s through the early 50s. And a lot of the people that opened those galleries had connections to the Art Institute over here on Chestnut. And once again, these are people that, many of whom were coming out of the armed services following, following World War II. They had their GI checks. And they were like, look, I've just been shooting at people and getting shot at for the last four years, I think I'm going to take up painting. I think one of the things that a lot of people don't really consider about the various different artistic subcultures that popped up after World War II was that a lot of it had to do with the fact that so many Americans went back to school. And it seems like such a simple thing, but it's true that all of a sudden you had all these people that were going back into not just academia, but learning different trades, learning different artistic skills. Lots of people went back to art school and they learned music or they learned painting or they learned theater or they learned writing, all these different disciplines. And they were also being exposed to new ideas for the first time, seeing a lot of really awful things in the conduct of, of war, and as well as seeing a lot of new places and new cultures and new people. And so there's this gigantic opening of the American mind, as I like to think about it. And so in... In the late 40s or thereabouts, there were all these artists that were gathered around the Art Institute, and a lot of them were very much aware that they were outsider artists. They didn't have major reputations or anything like that, and so, so many of them reasoned that, well, the only way that we're going to be able to show our stuff or make anything from what we're doing is if we do it ourselves. And so that itself engendered this do-it-yourself mentality with regard to self-promotion and you know getting their work out there. In 1947, the poet Madeline Gleason was instrumental in organizing one of the first festivals of modern poetry, as they called it, at a long since gone art gallery over on Gough Street. And that's one of the moments that's considered the beginning of the San Francisco Renaissance. And it included poets like Jack Spicer and Kenneth Rexroth and Madeline Gleason herself. And I think another one was Robert Duncan. But like a lot of those people were coming over from Berkeley. They were students at UC Berkeley or, you know, they had connections to Berkeley and came over here to the city to do something new. And you flash forward a couple of years and in 1953, City Lights Books opens. And City Lights had a unique concept right from the get-go. It began actually as a publication before it even had a storefront. It was called the City Lights Magazine. And they had film reviews and poetry and theater write-ups, translations of different things. And, you know, it's kind of an arts and culture magazine. And that was begun by a guy named Peter Martin. A little bit later on, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who had not 
all that long ago arrived from the East Coast after getting out of the the uh, service himself, he came to San Francisco and he had submitted some poems, I believe it was, to the City Lights magazine and ran into Peter Martin on the street. And Peter was in the process of trying to open a storefront to become a bookstore, the next logical step for the magazine. And so Ferlinghetti basically made him an offer right there on the street and said, hey, how'd you like me to be your partner? And so they each went in on the investment for $500 a piece and and uh, City Lights Books was formed. And one of the things that they held to some degree of importance was they wanted to get books into the hands of ordinary working class people. That was a, a huge part of their foundation. And so they became the first all paperback bookstore in the country. And that was significant because at the time we were still letter pressing books. And so to buy hardcover volumes was quite expensive. And so if you were a person of modest means, you really only had the library. You couldn't afford to buy big hardcover volumes. And also at the time, most paperback publications weren't very well thought of. They were the the cheesy sort of dime store pulp fiction, which also has a place in all this. A lot of the authors, like, for example, William S. Burroughs published his first book, Junkie, with Ace Books, which was a famous purveyor of pulp fiction. Very you know lurid, almost comic book covers. They were great, but everybody knew that it was delightful trash was the idea. And City Lights wanted to to make paperback books a contender in the literary world. And it was a, a convenient way, an efficient way for new writers, up and coming writers to make a name for themselves because paperback books were a lot less expensive. You could also, with the advent of a mimeograph machine, people had started self-publishing things. You could do, you could have a small press with a very small budget and mimeograph little pamphlets of poems or treatises or translations of philosophers from France, which, you know, which had become really popular. And you could do that relatively cheap and also your audience be able to afford them. And so City Lights became the first all paperback bookstore in the country. Uh, they also made a point of keeping later hours so that working class people, if you got off five or six o'clock, you could come in and, and read for a while. There was also a really vibrant scene in the cafes and the bars here. And that was a huge part of that community being built up because, as I believe I said before, so much of the housing around here was built up around the idea of itinerant people above all these storefronts or these small hotels with these tiny rooms, sink in the corner and bathroom down the hall. Sort of like a European style pensione, just very kind of bare bones. But if you were an artist, if you were poet if you were a writer that was perfect because there was this lifestyle developing where these people were constantly traveling the country they were constantly moving around and so they didn't have a lot of possessions they weren't trying to buy a house and fill it with stuff like other people were doing erstwhile in suburbia having a little cell above a cafe was perfect but because there was no common space in those buildings if you live in a rooming house somewhere your living room so to speak, was the cafe downstairs. It was the bar on the corner. And that's where you met up with your your friends and associates. And so there was this cafe culture that had developed here. There's also a story that comes from Papa Johnny, the founder of the Cafe Trieste in 1956, which also became a popular hangout for the Beats and still is for a lot of writers and artists. And he pointed out at one point that there was something about the Italian community that embraced the bohemian set in ways that others and the rest of the city did not. Because I think a lot of people, they were the first of their family in a new country and struggling to adapt to living in a new place and dealing with a new language and all of that. Having that familiarity of painters and artists and writers and poets hanging out in the cafes was like a little bit of home. There was something really familiar about that. And so his place became, likewise, this mecca for artists. And I think that had a lot to do with the Italian community. There was that connection there. I asked Brandon to share again the meaning of this label, Beat Generation. What the Beat Generation refers to is it was coined in, in the same mode as the Lost Generation that came before it or Generation X, or Millennials, or the, there was a 
a bit of overlap between the beat generation and like what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation in that novel that he wrote about that. The people that grew up during the depression, survived World War II and came back and rebuilt the country. When the term the beat generation was coined, these were people that were born circa 1920 or thereabouts and that were coming of age right as World War II was drawing to a close. So for example, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, and William Burroughs met one another at Columbia University in 1944. World War II ended in 1945. So these are people that when they met one another for the first time, Allen was about 18, Kerouac was 22, and William S. Burroughs, who was born in 1914, was about 30. That was significant because these are people that were right at the threshold of this major change in the culture. And what the beat generation referred to, the reason that they they started using that as a name for not just their circle of friends, but for their generation as a whole, the reason that they started using that term was because it implied a certain exhaustion. It, it was beat as in the sense of, oh, I'm beat. I'm, I've worked all day and I'm exhausted. It was a, a slang term that I believe came out of the African-American community at the time. There was a phrase people would say, oh man, I'm beat to the socks, which meant taken literally that you were so broke, you were so down and out that you were literally walking around without shoes on. And it was just an expression of being utterly at the bottom. So for a lot of people that were struggling to get through life in wartime, it was a perfect phrase because it implied that sense of like existential exhaustion. Nobody knew it was what was going to happen. There were all these restrictions on everything. Food was being rationed. Things were being rationed. There was the threat of air raids and there was the threat of being conscripted and there was just all this pressure. And you had to be mindful of your energy and the expenditure of it to make sure that you had enough to keep on keeping on. And it was actually the writer Herbert Hunky, I believe, that kind of introduced them to the term because Hunky was a street guy. He was from... Um, Chicago, I believe. And he arrived in New York City. And unlike his friends at Columbia that were almost upper class by default, William Burroughs came from a pretty well-to-do family. His family were the heirs to the, the Burroughs Corporation. They were the IBM of the mechanical age. His grandfather was the inventor of the adding machine. That company made everything from like the kinds of typewriters that you could put a financial ledger on to adding machines of various different sorts, cash registers, things of that nature. So the Burroughs came from a pretty well-to-do family. Allen Ginsberg's family was, I guess you could say, middle class. His father was a poet and an academic in, in Patterson, New Jersey. Kerouac was actually the more working class of the three. He came from Lowell, Massachusetts, and his father was a printer, and his mother worked in a shoe factory for a while. And they he grew up pretty poor, but also by virtue of having a football scholarship at Columbia University, he, he was better off. And so Hunky, on the other hand, arrived in New York City, and, and he had previously tied on a dope habit and was always living at the margins. He was always on the bum, as he put it. He was always broke, and he was always as you said, beat to the socks. And so when he used the term, he meant it quite literally, but he would use it around his friends and he, his friends were like, well, I guess you could say we're a beat generation in the sense that we're all down to our last reserve of resources. And so the name stuck. And it also brought a, a lot of other implications. Kerouac being a, a pretty devout Catholic, he decided, no, 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 it's, no, it's not necessarily beat as in down and out, but it's beat as in the sense of the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, the blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And his narrative, the idea that he was always trying to push was that theirs was a generation interested in compassion and sympathy and taking pleasure in life and the simple things. And that it wasn't necessarily this, uh, this sort of dour, down and out thing. But that was the thing. All of these people came together on the basis of, they just really loved ideas. They love discussing ideas and, and the things that mattered. And that was one of them. And I think every 20-something college student, you sit around a dorm room drinking red wine and puffing a little reefer and being like, well, what are the what are the big questions? What did, you know, what does it mean to be a part of our generation? Do we have something collectively that unites us? What do we share in common? What are the things that are important to us? What are our sort of generational values? How do we define us? I figured I'd read Ginsburg's America, just because it seems sort of apropos to what we were talking about. 
America, I've given you all and now I'm nothing. America, $2.27, January 17th, 1956. I can't stand my own mind. America, when will we end the human war? Go f*** yourself with your atom bomb. I don't feel good, don't bother me. I won't write my poem till I'm in my right mind. America, when will you be angelic? When will you take off your clothes? When will you look at yourself through the grave? When will you be worthy of your million Trotskyites? America, why are your libraries full of tears? America, when will you send your eggs to India? I'm sick of your insane demands. When can I go into the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? America, after all, it is you and I who are perfect and not the next world. Your machinery is too much for me. You made me want to be a saint. There must be some way to settle this argument. Burroughs is in Tangiers. I don't think he'll come back. It's sinister. Are you being sinister? Is this some form of practical joke? I'm trying to come to the point. I refuse to give up my obsession. America, stop pushing. I know what I'm doing. America, the plum blossoms are falling. I haven't read the newspapers for months. Every day someone goes on trial for murder. America, I feel sentimental about the Wobblies. America, I used to be a communist when I was a kid. I'm not sorry. I smoke marijuana every chance I get. I sit in the house for days on end and stare at the roses in the closet. When I go to Chinatown, I get drunk and never get laid. My mind is made up. There's going to be trouble. You've seen me reading Marx. My psychoanalyst thinks I'm perfectly right. I won't say the Lord's Prayer. I have mystical visions and cosmic vibrations. America, I still haven't told you what you did to Uncle Max after he came over from Russia. I'm addressing you. Are you going to let your emotional life be run by Time Magazine? I'm obsessed by Time Magazine. I read it every week. Its cover stares at me every time I slink past the corner candy store. I read it in the basement of the Berkeley Public Library. It's always telling me about responsibility. Businessmen are serious. Movie producers are serious. Everybody's serious but me. It occurs to me that I am America. I am talking to myself again. Asia is rising against me. I haven't got a Chinaman's chance. I better consider my national resources. My national resources consist of two joints of marijuana, millions of genitals, an unpublishable private literature that goes 1,400 miles an hour and 25,000 mental institutions. I say nothing about my prisons nor the millions of underprivileged who live in my flower pots under the light of 500 suns. I have abolished the whorehouses of France. Tangiers is the next to go. My ambition is to be president despite the fact that I'm a Catholic. America, how can I write a holy litany in your silly mood? I will continue like Henry Ford, my strophes are as individual as his automobiles, more so they're all different sexes. America, I will sell you strophes, 2500 apiece, 500 down on your old strophe. America, free Tom Mooney. America, save the Spanish loyalists. America, Sacco and Vanzetti must not die. America, I am the Scottsboro Boys. America, when I was seven, my mama took me to communist cell meetings. They sold us garbanzos, a handful per ticket, a ticket cost a nickel, and the speeches were free. Everybody was angelic and sentimental about the workers. It was all so sincere. You have no idea what a good thing the party was in 1835. Scott Nearing was a grand old man, a real mensch. Mother Bloor made everybody cry. I once saw Israel Amter playing. Everybody must have been a spy. America, you don't really want to go to war. America, it's them bad Russians. Them Russians them Russians and them Chinamen and them Russians. The Russia wants to eat us alive. The Russia's power mad. She wants to take our cars from out our garages. Her wants to grab Chicago. Her reads a Red Reader's Digest. Her wants our auto plants in Siberia. Him big bureaucracy running our filling stations. That no good. America, this is quite serious. America, this is the impression I get from looking on the television set. America, is this correct? I better get right down to the job. It's true I don't want to join the army or turn lathes in precision parts factories. I'm nearsighted and psychopathic anyway. America, I'm putting my queer shoulder to the wheel. 